It's my nerd world, the Star Wars show, and on this week's episode, continuing to talk about the Acolyte, this week, my thoughts on Episode 5, Night. As always, if you want to email talkshownerd at gmail.com. Nothing will stand in our way. I find your lack of faith disturbing. I will finish what you started. Who are you? I'm no one. There are stories about what happened. It's true. All of it. The Force. It's calling to you. My nerd road. Just bet it in. I said from the get-go, the Acolyte could have benefited, would have benefited. It's too late now. If they had released it all at once. I feel like there's... Like, two different things happening, and if you are listening to this show, My Nerd World, a Star Wars show, I'm your host, John Justice. Thank you so much for taking time out and checking out the episode. I greatly appreciate it. If you are completely separate from all the commentary in the fandom right now, and you are just watching this show as a Star Wars fan, casual mild fan, hardcore, doesn't matter. And you're just watching the show every week and you're completely disconnected from all the controversies swirling around this. Congratulations, I'm jealous. I wish I was I wish I was you. But it's the world that we live in now when it comes to fandom and commentary and we have so many options for entertainment. We are so increasingly disconnected from each other in a world where we are more connected via technology than we've ever been. And I'm of the opinion that we as human beings were never meant to be as connected as we are right now and our ability to shotgun opinions, consume opinions, which end up forming you know, headcanon for individuals, reinforcing opinions and views. I just don't think as a society, um, as human beings, that we handle that aspect of it very well. And I'm not going to get into the politics of that, but it impacts all aspects of our social sphere. But relating to fandoms and pop culture, it absolutely has an impact, and it probably has no greater impact than what you see within within Star Wars. So if you're if you're disconnected from all of this, you know, I'm, I'm I wish I could be you. Now, thankfully, I'm still able as a fan to um, love the Star Wars that I love, and I posted this on X recently. Speaking of the social sphere and social networking, that I I I love um, I love I love I love I love Star Wars. Right. Um, I love almost all of Star Wars. I don't love everything of Star Wars. It makes me a bit and I am a bit of a Star Wars apologist because of it. And I, I, I like going and consuming the commentary around it and even a lot of the negativity swirling around this show. But this is a long winded way to say if they had released the Acolyte all at once they could have avoided all the controversies surrounding this show. Because I'm convinced that so many of the non-injection criticisms of agenda, which are certainly there and they're legitimate, but there's a lot of frustration around this show because of decisions that it's made. And we'll talk spoilers for uh, episode five night, which I thoroughly enjoyed. But there's a lot of individuals that are upset because of things that are happening in the show that may go and contradict canon. And I'm convinced at this point that those questions are going to be answered. And many of those have already been answered. People have their own legitimate concerns and takes on the way that the story is written, some of the editing choices. And I agree with those things. I think that the direction in a lot of these, in these first five episodes, is lacking in a lot of different ways. I think a part of that is because, unfortunately, we don't have corporations 
that are creating content anymore and hiring people based off of solely um, their skills, you know, meritocracy, if you will. Um, they're being hired for other reasons. And I think because of that, there's a lot of people that aren't as talented that are crafting and creating these shows and they're not coming out as good as they could. So that part aside, I want to talk about the show now just from specifically an enjoyment standpoint and not from a criticism um, standpoint. And I continue to be in the place where I've been really since last week. And that is I loved the first two episodes. I thought episode three was incredibly weak and had a ton of problems. When I do a rewatch, and I will, of The Acolyte, I'll probably be skipping over that episode, or at least portions of it that I simply don't want to watch, because I know the story that plays out. And clearly, in the remaining episodes that we have, we are going to get other viewpoints of what took place in the 16-year flashback, because we still have questions that are unanswered in this story. But getting to this week's episode... Um, the first, you know, three fourths of the episode was absolutely stunning. I mean, moments watching it where I was thinking to myself, this is some of the best live action Star Wars we've had so far. Now, this is a completely subjective take. Understand, have other shows been written better? Absolutely. Have there been other moments in other shows that may have been crafted and 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 directed better absolutely from a just going on a ride star wars and loving lightsaber battles which i do this was some of the best choreography in my opinion that we've seen in any um star wars live action content movie or tv um, i'm also a big fan and no surprise i've said this on the show of the 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 choreography that was in say the rise of skywalker i thought it had some of the best um lightsaber duels of all of the uh, of all the films when you go back and look at the original trilogy you know the the dest uh excuse me the um the darth vader luke skywalker fight in the empire strikes back at the end on bespin um it's 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 incredible you know and, and a product of its time um, as is the, the Death Star 2 battle in, in Return of the Jedi. We have different styles of filmmaking now, and we have a lot, uh, we have more interesting choreography than we did before. Uh, those are good for what they are. I think what we have in the prequels is, is very good. I think much of the lightsaber battles in the prequels, though, tend to be sort of overly choreographed where you can see the moves ahead of time what we've seen in the sequel trilogy i think has been fantastic um what we saw in ahsoka was great but the the action sequences in the beginning of episode five were just stunning um i made the i made the the comment to kyle my 17 year old that they are off the chain um probably a term that me uh, being a 52 year old here in about a week probably shouldn't be making anymore be that as it may they were off the chain um, was guessing that Quimir was going to be who is called the stranger so for moving forward in the episode uh, we'll just be referring to the to the smiley faced zipper face helmeted guy the official name for him for the products is the stranger so we'll call him the stranger the guy who identified as the sith I thought he did a fantastic job as that character. And I was actually getting very concerned that we were going to actually see him die in this episode. And that would have bummed me out because you kind of get tired of seeing these really cool dark side characters get wiped out. Now, of course, they can always come back like a Darth Maul. But when you look at the uh, Inquisitor uh, that uh, got killed and had all of the the green uh, Night Sister magic come out of him. Uh, was that Morok? He was a great looking character, and they killed him off early. So I was glad to see that this character is going to remain, not just from his look, but the way that he carried that that character. I thought it was fantastic. The dialogue between him and the Jedi was was great. Uh, they were brave enough to go and start taking out a bunch of Jedi main characters in this, and some of the most brutal Star Wars that we've uh, ever seen before. Again, if this show had been released where we could go and binge it, my opinion is there would be a much different take on it right now. And it would be easier for people to accept. 
the flaws in the show and not be pushing that negativity for weeks on end every single time a new episode um, comes out. And again, now I'm back to the discourse um, again. The second half of the episode, I thought it slowed down, but I think that was intentional. They couldn't keep up uh, the the pace of the opening part of the show, and the story necessitated that they go and, and slow it down. But the Acolyte is doing a very good job of, of continuing to sort of raise the stakes, raise more questions, and has me once again just dying to see the next episode. I question the... True motivations of May at this point, and it's probably this probably would land on a picky knit criticism. I'm not quite exactly sure where she's coming from yet, and I'm taking the angle at the moment of waiting to see her story arc be completely fleshed out because it seems like she's gone back and forth in relatively short periods of time. I'm Interested to go back and watch episode four and five back to back to see how it plays out since episode five picks up right after episode four ends. But it seemed as if she was willing to go and turn herself in the Jedi, but then she ends up flipping once again. And there could be better story beats that I'm simply missing from having not watched them back to back. But it seems like she's kind of all over the place at the at the moment. At the end of the episode, I was thinking that the showrunner, Leslie Hedlund, had mentioned that this is supposed to be a story about how the Sith, how could the Sith infiltrate the Jedi. And so her now taking on the, you know, impersonating Osha certainly could be, you know, a pathway towards that. I question why Soul isn't sensing that that's not Osha and that's May. I'm also questioning why he hasn't seen the tattoo on her forehead yet. Be that as it may, no pun intended, I'm willing to let the show play out because so far it's answered some of the questions that we've had. And I trust in people like Dave Filoni. Dave Filoni, who is essentially kind of in charge of the story group within uh, Lucasfilm, you know, he has to sign off on all of uh, these stories at the end. And I trust that he will make sure that the, you know, the T's are crossed and the I's are, the I's are dotted. And there's through lines to all of these various questions that are, that are open based off of where this appears within the within the timeline. My speculation at this point in time is that there's still another big bad in all of this. We had the stranger say straight up, one, the Jedi would call me Sith. So he's trying to be a, a Sith. But we've also seen versions of this that weren't full Sith yet. When you go back and think about Asajj Ventress, for example, um, and I'm lifting now from the non-canon Clone Wars cartoons, the original 2D animation, where she wanted to be Sith, but she wasn't yet. And that fantastic exchange that she had with Count Dooku in one of the earlier earlier episodes. But here's a character that was dabbling in Dark Side Forces, but wasn't full-on Sith. I mean, the Inquisitors kind of fall into this category as well. But he says, you know, that she's an acolyte. So he's clearly an apprentice to somebody else. And with the remaining episodes, not knowing where we're going with all of this and considering that we're at a place now, at, at a, a bit of a crossroads with all these characters, I'm really suspecting that within an episode or two, we're going to see the reveal of the big bad. There's clearly something else that took place. And again, this goes back to we'll get another angle from what happened 16 years ago. Because of the conversations that were happening between Osha and May and the stranger and Saul almost going and telling Osha what had happened. I'm curious why Yord knew who the stranger was unless he was simply referring back to when they saw him on the planet in the earlier episode, which is most likely the answer. Because there's also a moment between the stranger and Soul where he says, you still don't know who I am. So again, either Soul has a connection with him beyond what we've seen so far, or he's simply referring to when they saw this character before when they were following around May on the planet with the Jedi Temple in in episode two. Because there's also a quick moment where the stranger goes and says, is that its name? 
relating to Jecky. And that was a callback to Jecky making sort of a, a I don't want to say derogatory, but a rather insulting comment relating to him on that planet as well. So I think the connection there is simply they were watching him, saw him before, but didn't realize that it was the same person. Now, it's possible that there is another connection beyond that, but um, that's where I think the connection is coming in. At the end of the episode, I don't know whether or not the stranger healed Osha. It seemed as if she had that stab wound to her side. He certainly used the force to roll her over. But I didn't see in the moment, it didn't look as if he had healed her at all. It just looks like she had a wound and he was basically turning her over. Now, of course, this raises the question of whether or not the stranger knows that he's there with Osha and not May. And it clearly is Osha. She has the tattoos on her arm. So that kind of gave away the fact that they have now swapped um, you know, personalities. So heading into next week, we're going to have a moment where Osha wakes up and sees herself face-to-face with uh, with Quimir, with the stranger. So, again, a lot of questions of where this is all going, including the fact that Basil, the tracker, has Pip. Pip's going to immediately recognize that that's not um, Osha. So I think in fairly short order, Sol is going to realize that this is not um, Osha, and this is actually, actually May, which... Raises the question, and I'm doing a lot of that, of whether or not Soul makes it through all all of this. So I really enjoyed uh, the episode, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And I like what they're doing. It's incredibly unfortunate that there's so much negative commentary around it. It's incredibly unfortunate that the individuals that created this show have taken so many opportunities to inject things within their own commentary around the show that are simply unproductive within the fandom. And it's really ruining it for a lot of people. And now you have, just getting back to the discourse side of things, now you have this whole contingent of individuals. You kind of have this Venn diagram, right? Everybody's watching the show in the middle, and then you have all these factions. I think you have some people that are watching it, loving it, and just dismissing everything else. There are some people watching it, loving it, and think that anybody that doesn't like it is a horrible, awful person. You have people that don't like it, but they don't like it for very subjective and rational reasons. You have people that don't like it, they hate it, aren't and aren't allowing the show to continue to answer the questions that they have. And you have individuals that it doesn't matter. They're going to hate it regardless because they're making a lot of money off of it. And it's affecting the overall success of it because this does have an impact on the you know the the rating scores and how people view it. And it's just unfortunate from a person that wants to see more Star Wars. I think they need to pull back a bit because I think we've been inundated with a lot of Star Wars and there's overkill. I also think the Star Wars needs to be up on the on the big screen. I think it works better on the big screen. And it's so funny, as I'm recording this, uh, my friend Zach from the Knights of Vader podcast, one of my favorites, sent me a, a GIF uh, based off of last night, and I'm not sure exactly what that means. I'm actually going to type to him right now. Recording pod right now, mentioning your GIF. <laughs> LOL. This is how things happen in... Uh, in, in in real time. So what do you think? I just wanted to share my overall thoughts. I can't do an incredibly long show this week. I've got a pack for my trip to California. As I mentioned, I'm going on vacation next week, so there won't be a podcast until we get through episode six and after episode uh, episode seven. But I'd love to know what you think. I, I just I really enjoyed it. And I think if it wasn't for all the controversy surrounding it, I think this would be a, a, a better accepted show. Has it made some mistakes? Absolutely, it's made some mistakes. Is it the best Star Wars ever created? No, it's not. But I'm fully entertained in every single week anticipating the next episode. One other story beat that I wanted to uh, to mention is that they didn't explain it in the show, but for those that have read a lot of the Star Wars books, um, the shutting off of the lightsaber blades... Is via this metal called uh, cortosis, 
where the metal actually has the ability to shut down lightsaber blades. And that's what we saw in the middle of this battle. And I thought that was really cool how the stranger, Quimir, was utilizing this in these lightsaber fights, which, again, I just thought were just bonkers. I thought the choreography was just absolutely um, uh, amazing. I mean, I'm going to go back and watch it just for just for that. And I thought that the choreography in the Ahsoka series was great. And to me, this was even better than uh, than that. So from that standpoint, they're doing they're doing a really fantastic job. I hope they do as good a job when we get to the the big screen films. I am worried though. I'll give you a quick a uh, quick comment on the uh, so we have the Mandalorian and Grogu film that's coming out in 2027. That's going to be our first Star Wars film and that'll be followed by the post episode 9 Ray movie. Uh, 15 years after the events of The Rise of Skywalker, directed by um, um, our main show, Obeyed Shinoi. I think I'm saying her name wrong, but she was quoted recently saying that she's ignoring all of the fandom commentary until she gets done with the uh, with the movie. Take for that what you will. I can go either way. <laughs> I'm a little bit concerned over this director, their lack of experience in directing major motion pictures. I feel like these types of movies need to be handled with a very um, carefully crafted, seasoned individual. We're not at a point right now within Star Wars to be trusting directing a major Star Wars film to an individual who doesn't have blockbuster filmmaking experience. I hope that I am proven wrong, uh, however. Before we wrap things up, I do have a couple of listener feedback items that came in uh, this week. I need someone to show me my place in all this. First one comes from friend of the show, Michael E. Tennant. Now, he's responding to a comment that I made last week. We're surrounded by those things in life we don't agree with. And he says that's exactly why people don't want it in the entertainment that they consume. I agree. People like to escape from their day to day and be transported to a place that is removed from the BS of the real world. If everything else was on point, the writing, character development, world building, and dialogue, then perhaps it wouldn't matter as much. However, the Acolyte repeatedly trips over itself with mediocre dialogue, bizarre character choices, bad pacing, and on top of and on top of an on-the-nose messaging. Those things are compounded by ridiculously short episodes. Completely agree with that. You mentioned that the fans need to give it room to breathe, but the show itself doesn't even give itself room to breathe. Everything is so rushed, and now the main antagonist is already uh, flipping. uh, We have the main antagonist already flipping halfway through the season. At the end of the day, we're left with a half-baked show at best that's based on its premise had the potential to be a really great chapter in the saga. This is the interesting about the commentary surrounding that, because I don't disagree with what Michael is saying. Those things are true. Comparatively speaking to other shows that I'm watching as of late, you just you wonder where the budget went in all of this. But again, this is all the ancillary things that I'm talking about that we know because we have so much access to information about these about these shows. And while everything he said was true. I guess I default to, and I've always done this, and this is me personally, because I like movies that are almost objectively bad, okay? Jupiter Ascending. I really enjoyed that film. Is it a good movie? No, not really. Didn't do well in the box office, and for good reason. Um, uh, Independence Day Resurgence, the sequel. Also not a good movie. Just watched it again the other day for, I don't know, the sixth, seventh time, because I enjoy watching it, and I'm entertained. If... It's not so bad that I can't sort of shut off and look past those things. You know, I'm okay. Sometimes that doesn't happen for me. Trying to watch Kenobi, I've attempted to do that. And I and for that show, I can't get past it. For that show, I can't turn everything off and just enjoy it for what it is. It doesn't have enough redeeming things for me from a subjective standpoint. But with The Acolyte, even despite the legitimate criticisms that people have, I'm still really enjoying it and... I will be going back and and watching this. I'll also mention that because of where this is placed in the timeline, because this is so far removed from everything else, and I'm not talking about the quality of the production and the writing and those things, right? Those things I've already mentioned, I can get past those particular things. But in terms of certain story beats and having, we'll see 
we'll see lightsaber whips in the very near future in the in the show because it's so it's so far removed from even the Phantom Menace. I'm okay, I, I I'm personally okay with that. But Michael, what you're saying isn't isn't wrong. It was funny after last week's episode, which I didn't necessarily have an issue with. I enjoyed it. It was short. I agree with you. I was bummed at the end. Um, but it's almost so short, there's just little to complain about, right? But I walked away from that going, I can't wait for next week. And I wasn't necessarily disappointed this week. The second half of it, I think it slowed down a bit, left with a lot of questions. But that's what this show has been doing. So I know I just have to wait until until next week. But I heard commentary on the Big Thing podcast with Christian Harloff. And they made all these criticisms. And all those criticisms were completely valid. And yet I kind of went, eh, I still enjoyed it. Star Wars is what you is what you make it. Uh, Mike Rotunda said, speaking of last week's episode, this was the best episode yet. And yes, I think it's too uh, it's too on the nose with the guy being a Sith. It's like they want us to think it's him. In my opinion, well, now we know. I think the Sith is a female, and well, we know she's not, unless it's the big bad. Because the front cape, when somebody is wearing a front cape, it usually means to hide the female anatomy. Also, on another note, I think. Uh, might be the Sith, uh, is the main Jedi, the one who had his shirt off in the other uh, other episode. Nope, that's not the case because he's dead now. But it's good to uh, hear from you, uh, Mike. So, there's a lot of my uh, convoluted comments and thoughts for this week's uh, episode. I enjoyed it. I did. Is it the best Star Wars ever? No, but I did think it had some of the best action and lightsaber fight in the lightsaber sequences that I'd ever seen. I'll just go back and watch the beginning of it for that uh, for that reason alone. All right, before I head off on uh, vacation, if you have not done it, I hope that you will go and take the time to check out my own personal science fiction space opera series, Embark. Treat yourself a friend or a family member with science fiction written for adults, but it is fantastic for ages 11 plus in terms of the content. Pick up Embark Book One today. It's available in ebook, Kindle Unlimited, hardcover, paperback, and audio book. Seven books in all in the series where you can follow pilots Taft, Katha, and their crew after Earth faces its end on a journey of survival across the galaxy as they fight for theirs and humanity's future among the stars. If you like your science fiction space opera to be epic, filled with romance and action, Embark is perfect for you. Go to Amazon.com and search for Embark, E-M-B-A-R-K, and John J-O-N Justice and check it out. So I hope you have a fantastic uh, 4th of July uh, here in the uh, States. I'll be back in a couple of weeks. I also hope wherever you are, you are happy, you are healthy, and you are safe. God bless, and I'll talk to you then. Bye. The Force will be with you. Always. My nerd road. <laughs>